It is safe to assume every city located along the length of the great Mississippi has a number of stories and secrets to share with a curious visitor or passing traveler. Some of these tales are well known and often told, while others have been lost over time or held close by the local residents. Over the years that the Big Muddy has been a resource for trade and commerce, there have been many industries and groups equally willing to add their narratives, myths, and legends to the lore of the river. Pirates, outlaws, lumbermen, miners, fishermen and clammers, and freighters too, were some of the better known and famous contributors. Their truths and fictions were equal in every measure to the romance and mystery of the rivermen on steam paddle wheels and long barges that cruised the wide waters. However, there was also a scattering of others who gave important support to the growth of the young United States in its early stages of expansion. Fewer in numbers, these individuals achieved singular successes and established businesses that made positive changes for a given period of the river's fame and story. And then they disappeared and were forgotten by all but a few. In the summer of 2012, a group of volunteers from the River Museum in Dubuque were asked to travel to Bellevue, Iowa for an inspection of a well-kept treasure known by a few beyond that city's boundaries. A road trip followed with eight volunteers along with museum staff to learn one of those mislaid histories. They were going to open a River City time capsule. In a sturdy building of undressed limestone rocks stacked two stories high, was a historical secret just waiting to become remembered and appreciated after 100 years as a forgotten, important industrial member of the community. Measuring roughly 61 feet in length and 22 feet in width, the Iowa Marine Engine and Launch Works was a famous and thriving business in the early 1900s. Located on the corner of Chestnut and South 2nd Street, barely two blocks from the banks of the Mississippi River, the company was the source of inboard combustion engines for commercial and leisure boats all along the river and throughout the country as well. Started in 1898, the business grew and expanded, gradually putting more attention toward the blooming sport of speedboat racing. As the source of some of the finest racing boat engines and boats built, it was the parent of the famous record-breaking Red Top series of speedboats, which established the sport's design by setting a record in 1908 at 36 miles per hour. Perhaps the more historical significant of their efforts were the racing boats with the eight-cylinder engines that powered them. Racing fans remember fondly the Red Tops from 1 and 2 right up to Red Top 4, achieving a peak speed of 50 miles per hour. While these speeds may seem a bit tame today with our rockets and jets, they were astounding accomplishments in their time period and ranked shoulder to shoulder with the automobile, electric lights, and telephones of the era. But equally important were the smaller single and double cylinder motors that powered thousands of commercial boats and family launches. These vessels enabled families to relax and enjoy the river experiences, while others used their crafts to earn a living and provide for their families on the rivers and waterway. Seen here in 1912 with one of his iconic eight-cylinder racing motors, Joseph Brandt was known throughout the racing circles of the day. It is recorded that most of the Bellevue residents lined the riverbanks to watch the maiden voyages of his famed motor launches. An interesting side note, Joe Brandt didn't own any of his speedboats, but built them for others and was happy to share their successes. The Iowa Marine Engine Shop was also equally known 
for their quality standards and economical single and double cylinder motors that were sold far and wide. For nearly 40 years, Brandt's company built boats and motors recognized for dependability and affordability. It is estimated the Bellevue Machine Shop turned out about 3,500 inboard engines starting around 1900 until the business shut down in 1930, a result of the invention of the outboard motor, a less expensive competitive product. All 3,500 engines were built from scratch in the existing building, which for the time was also an achievement. Over the years following the business closing, the machine shop was utilized for automotive work and repairs, as well as hobby projects, each generation of the family learning on the still existing equipment. Often the shop was a local gathering spot for friends with a project or seeking the opportunity to chat with motor enthusiasts and reminisce on the good old days and lost friends. William Brandt was the pivot point for these gatherings and frequent sessions of nostalgia. With the passing of the third generation of the Brandt family in April 2012, the heirs decided to find a suitable home for the machine shop, which remained virtually untouched for the past century, locked safely in its limestone vault. Their stated intent was to find and transfer the entire collection to a facility where the historical significance would be preserved and also displayed for current and future generations to appreciate. Jan Brinker, William's cousin and executrix of his estate, announced at an earlier date that the entire contents of the shuttered Bellevue factory would be given to the National Mississippi River Museum and Aquarium in Dubuque, Iowa. Quoted in the Bellevue Herald Leader on October 24, 2013, Brinker said, We think this is the best way to pay tribute to the Brandt family. The Mississippi River Museum will be constructing a separate building to display the equipment and it will be in a place that is visited by a lot of people. She went on to say, we want people to know we didn't sell them. All the machines in that building will be taken down by experts at the Mississippi River Museum and reassembled in Dubuque. Brinker also emphasized that as part of the donation, we also asked that a video be made so patrons of the museum could watch and understand what they are looking at. That decision and announcement was the trigger that led to the road trip to Bellevue by the group of senior volunteers who were asked to visit the preserve factory and report back to the museum staff their impressions and suggestions for securing the contents and any ideas for utilization of the collection. The unanimous report from the inspection party was one of awe and delight. Upon entering the building, all experienced a sensation of traveling back in time and visiting a long-lost fragment of river history. One group member said he expected to see Joe Brandt, the founder of the company, shown here in 1900, appear from behind one of the large lathes at any given moment. Their attention was directed immediately to the original steam engine, the source of power for the line shaft belt driven system. Converted from steam to compressed air after the business closed, it remained securely mounted on a central post and showed no indication of neglect or its true age. Of course, the visiting assembly felt obligated to investigate every nook and cranny, scrambling into each area of the shop, not unlike an unruly group of children on a playground. Each article had to be held, weighed, and identified for its possible age and purpose. No item would be overlooked or slighted, even though tools and parts were everywhere and left in place as if used just yesterday. Constantly shouts of, wow, come look at this, 
haven't seen one of these in ages, were heard in every voice from every quarter. An overhead belt-driven line shaft, which has been in place since 1900, spans the length of the shop's overhead interior and delivers the power for all machinery on both sides of the main floor. Still in working order, the assorted belts and pulleys power a series of metal lathes, a drill press, metal saws, grinding wheels, and many other unique and dedicated mechanical wonders that once shaped and refined parts for hundreds of marine engines. In any direction they investigated, they found an assortment of parts, tools, and personal items, giving us all the sense that the former employees had only left for the day and would or could return to work the next morning. Everyday items were tucked carefully into shelves along with the tools and machine components and templates. Precision castings in bronze and iron were scattered about, waiting to be refined and balanced before joining others in becoming a new engine. The next phase of the inspection was almost intuitive on the part of each group member. Inspection of the actual tools to confirm they were adjusted properly and able to function if engaged now. Some minor corrections were performed to confirm that all units seemed to be in amazing condition. A leather belt or two showed signs of needing some tender care, but a brief search soon yielded the materials to make repairs and return them to full service. It was also immediately obvious that the collective knew exactly what and how to bring about the remedies. In a short period of time, the belts were back in their assigned positions and ready to go to work, showing no signs whatever of having been repaired. Hey. 
Eventually, the ultimate questions were given voice. Will this baby still run? Can we start her up? The Brandt family members within earshot quickly offered approval for the visitors to figuratively light her up. After locating and starting the air compressor and allowing time for the storage tanks to fill sufficiently, all attention turned to the venerable 100-year-old converted steam engine. With little effort and coaxing, plus a knob turner too, the air compressor was pumping to fill the cylinder and tanks to the required head of steam to start it up. A slight hesitation, and then the engine began to chug out its song. The belts began to turn. The overhead line shaft and secondary belts, drives, and pulleys started the various machines and courts. And the whole shop was a cacophony of mechanical notes. Every unit moved at its assigned rate, determined by the individual belt-to-pulley relationship. The blend of sounds produced a harmony that was truly very close to a long, silent symphony being played for an appreciative audience. It was a sheer delight to see all the belts push the machines into motion and listen to the clinking, clanking, and steady, syncopated beat of the steam engine as its cylinder went up and down to drive the assembly. Eagerly, the band of observers watched and were quick to apply any additional lubricant that might be needed for a smoother operation. They also scurried around to revisit favorites to watch them in operation and take note of any and all special actions or functions. Alternative rates and speeds were applied by adjusting the drive belts on the related line shaft drums to produce a test of each configuration. Yet the steadfast steam engine maintained its consistent pace without faltering.
The large drill press was easily adjusted to a much slower rate to encourage the meticulous penetration of a heavy steel component without hesitation. As the drill bit turned, an indexing gear gently advanced the bit downward, pushing small curls of cut steel to all sides. and shiny nail heads alongside proud wood knots. Workers once stood at the machines for hours. These are the places where cast metal parts for engines were shaped and refined to precision tolerances. These are the spots where each worker set his equipment and made the many adjustments to enable the final motor to perform reliably and repeatedly as it was expected to. Steel shafts mounted in the large lathes were systematically trimmed down by tempered cutting tools as the steady rhythm of the pulsing engine filled the whole shop. An assorted number of gears provide the calculated mechanical advantage to turn each unit at their needed speed and torque. It was interesting to all to note that these designs and decisions were all managed without help from computers. Taken as a whole, the marine engine shop was a masterwork of engineering, set up to achieve many tasks from a single power source, and thereby surely qualified as cutting-edge technology of the early 20th century. Once the initial elation over the successful startup had died down a little, and everyone had checked over each unit, they turned their attention to the building's upper floor. Included in the total factory collection is a large variety of wooden casting models used to produce the bronze and iron castings incorporated into the marine engines. Storage for these items was provided on the upper level, and included with them were a modest quantity of boat and launch patterns as well. Also found in the storage area were a limited number of fittings and patterns and other components that went into the boats and launches that began in Bellevue, Iowa, and then traveled far and wide to rivers and streams across the country. Satisfied they had explored every possible item and area of the shop, the group reluctantly abandoned the factory and searched out a source for lunch and a space to talk. Food orders taken, conversations and questions were quickly posed concerning the relocation of everything to Dubuque. When to start, where to locate it all, and how to accomplish it with care and efficiency. 
Universal agreement was noted that all items should be included to tell the complete story of the shop and its contribution to history. Everything should be displayed just as it now stands in the factory, fully operational and able to function as it does now. It was imperative and obvious to all as well that the relocation needed to be a single action from takedown to move to reinstall with no interruptions permitted in the process lest critical components be lost or misplaced. All were confident that this factory may be the only completely functional line shaft marine engine factory in the entire country, which makes it so very unique and requiring of preservation. The National Mississippi River Museum and Aquarium is very proud and humbled to be named the caretaker of such a significant chapter in Iowa's history. The legacy of the Brandt family and the genius of J.M. Brandt need to be displayed and shared with all citizens and future generations. Young people especially will benefit from learning what and how their forebears accomplished the advances we all enjoy today. A museum associated with the National Smithsonian Museum in Washington, D.C. is exactly the proper location to display and explain the contribution of the brands, their work and products, and the part it all played in the growth of the region and the state. Additionally, the connection to the great Mississippi River, its long history, and its continuing involvement in the life on the river make this new collection for the museum an exciting occasion and stellar addition. Now, the many tasks ahead to uninstall, relocate, and reinstall the marine engine shop to Dubuque must begin. A site must be prepared, and then everything will need to be mounted to its original and fully operational condition. Once completed, the Iowa Marine Engine and Launch Works collection and the story of the Brandt family's legacy will be a bright new jewel in the National Mississippi River Museum and Aquarium.